How would I describe a little bit racy? Well, really it's a state of mind more than anything else. It's a way of really entering the palace and theatre of the mind and, and exploring new parts of the world in new situations, seeing the world through a new light, understanding celebrity and, and the world itself in a unique and fascinating way that really is just all about improv comedy where, you know, some people try and be funny for a few minutes and uh, I try and just, you know, keep them all controlled. What is a little bit racy? It's basically... I remember back when you were really young and you'd create these fantastic worlds with your friends or maybe your sister or brother or cousin or someone when you're really small and you can do anything in this world and anything is possible. That's basically what racy is, but with grown-ups. <laughs> uh, what is a little bit racy? Uh, it's uh, basically advanced Dungeons and Dragons, or without the advanced really, meets uh, GCSE Geography meets the Manson Trial. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, it, it kind of... Uh, Oh god. <laughs> it, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I, you, you, you basically, James explained everything way more succinctly than me. I just, And welcome to A Little Bit Racy, the improvisation comedy panel show that you just couldn't make up. I'm your host, James Cottle, and these are just a few highlights from Series 2 of our radio production. In the show, panellists race against a time limit of just three minutes to improvise their way to a destination. They begin from different starting points and must use an assortment of randomly assigned objects, companions, and modes of transport, but they must keep all of them with them when they travel. They also have to overcome another panellist who will improvise obstacles to try and stop them. And first off, we find Johnny trying to get to the Top Gear test track in Surrey to stop the fist-happy presenters. Armed with nothing but Wolfram Gladiators, a unicycle without a seat, and a strange piece of optical illusion psychic paper, as Daryl tries his best to stop him. Now we must get to the test track in Surrey to stop uh, whatever's going on in Top Gear. They are terrible people. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... <laughs> Uh, we both jump on the unicycle. I'll make sure Wolf's on first because he's into that. Uh, and I like jump on his shoulders. <laughs> and we're going down South China. Uh, innuendos are flying right after, now. After about a 400 miles of going down South China, wherever that is. <laughs> Why are you going that way? I have no idea. Uh, Wolf's he's, he's not gone well. He's, he's, he's screaming in agony. There's, there's blood everywhere, guts everywhere. Let's, let's, let's sort him out quickly. Um, that's okay because I also have with me my optical illusion picture and he has to see his said injury and I say look Wolf it's fine and it shows him a pot of um, oh. wonderful bandages <laughs> <laughs> so he assumes that I'm going to fix him and it's okay we decide okay south isn't possibly the way we want to go we go north we go to Russia now we can get across the Russian border because I have my optical illusion picture with me which actually works like the psychic paper from Doctor Who instant <laughs> pictures much. I get across any border I like but it turns out that this Border Patrol actually has two brain cells and isn't fooled by a single blank piece of paper <laughs> This is psychic paper, Dan. Oh, sorry. Optical so illusion sorry. picture. So I hold it in front of you, and what do you see? What do you see? Oh, isn't that nice? You see me, getting, nice? you see me getting to Surrey. Yes, you yes. do. <laughs> there it is. Meanwhile, Daryl is having his own problems. But fortunately, the London Symphony Orchestra, whom he happens to be travelling with across China, have helped him board the nearest available train. And the only thing he has with him for help is one single swimming flipper. <laughs> so I said, tell him we've got to get to Surrey. They said, it's fine. Anyway, she translates that, we've got to get to Surrey. Luckily, she knows of a fantastic rail route all the way through China, the Trans-China Express. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> yeah, that definitely exists. Uh, Trans-China Express, and it goes, frankly, all the way 
to Calais. <laughs> <laughs> Which is lucky. How, how expensive sound? was the ticket for everyone remaining in the London Symphony Orchestra? Oh, it was yourself? expensive. <laughs> oh, it was expensive. Where would you get the money for that? We, well, we didn't because this is China. <laughs> <laughs> it's communist. Everyone gets a ticket. <laughs> everyone gets a ticket. It's just a nice country like I'll that. I'll allow it. But uh, Thank you very much. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, so we've got to get to Surrey, but it's fine because we've got one flipper. We don't need to get a ticket in the tunnel because they'll think we're probably immigrants. Uh, so, so it's fine. So Ten we'll seconds just, left. Oh, so, so we'll flipper across so it's only 25 miles David Williams did it in about three hours it's fine. It's fine. so we can we can get there and then it's just a quick run to Surrey but, but I'm, I'm sure there's some congestion we'll, we'll go on the outer M25 ring uh, and, and, and probably get there a little bit late but we'll come in some anyway before Chris can start his round somewhere in the Channel 4 countdown studio with Dwayne the Rock Johnson and a pair of stilts on wheels he has a few things he wants to clear up first a uh, very quick question. Yes. Where is Tanzania? In Africa. Right. And where's Leeds? In <laughs> the United Kingdom. Okay. And what are the places in between those two points, including I'm sure you'll have fun finding out. <laughs> <laughs> Best of luck to you, Chris. Your time starts now. Okay, I'm in the countdown corner with the countdown celebrity guest, Wayne the Wop Johnson, I presume. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, have, I, I swear this isn't me making stuff up. I can actually walk on stilts. <laughs> no, I hop, if, Are I'm, you used to them being on wheels, though? Uh, no, which is why it's a good thing I have the Wop to stabilise me. Because oh, that's, he's that's solid good, yeah. that's sure. as a um, Dwayne. On your way out of the countdown studio, you bang your head on one of the studio lights because the stilts are that high. Okay, I'm a man, so I just power through it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> ah, Dwayne the Rock Johnson, still current countdown champion by the way. Pip is in complete control of the situation however, as he ventures into the jungle with just his companion Philip Schofield for protection and a London Eye capsule for transport. As luck would have it, uh, Gary Busey is in the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa yep. hunting predators. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and for various legal means, has big security tagged. <laughs> and everyone in the UK has been administered these uh, compasses that show where he is. But as luck would have it, we want to find Gary Busey because he's in Africa. You, it's only at this point where you realise the earth-shattering realisation that Philip Schofield and Gary Busey have beef. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in case no one here speaks frat boy, beef means that they don't like each other. Um, well, of course that's true. It's Gary Busey. Yeah, yeah, I mean, to be fair. So I tell him that, you know, we, Wassie is the priority. He is your friend and fellow presenter. And then after all said and done, you can settle that grudge between Busey. <laughs> okay, you can, you can take him on mano a mano. I'm looking forward to in this. The, in, in the heart of Africa. <laughs> rumble in the jungle. And he goes, and as soon as, like, the blood craze fills his eyes... <laughs> It's like, yes, and with that extra, you know, promise of vengeance, he get we get in the capsule and he just powers through over, you know, the outbands and <laughs> over the pow over majority of like Australia and then we Meanwhile, Joe Darcy has assembled her legion of elderly OAP ramblers together and prepares to take to the water. What can David do to stop her? Right, okay. So uh, we head down to the canal and because they're all old ramblers, they've got loads of friends who have these big barges. And so I stick them in all the way through, much like a slave ship, because that works. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. But waiting uh, for you above one of the bridges on the canal is my skip full of after eight mints. And as you approach beneath it, I start tipping up and you get covered in an avalanche, quite apt, of after eight mints. <laughs> Yeah, and I rub it all over me because it acts as kind of a greasy kind of protection against the waves. I know. Wow. <laughs> Picture that, if you will. I so am. I, I <laughs> <laughs> Ten seconds. Thank you for giving me the <laughs> Just give me a minute here. <laughs> Generous. Um, you go, I go into the water in front and I uh, use the rope to attach it. I'm now very slick with my after eight stuff. Also, I'm an added temptation to the ramblers who are fitfully trying to get through through using their saggy arm skin attached to their rambling sticks as some kind of makeshift oar. Oh, um, again, yeah. not people. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. But what's this? David Ruddock has just jumped out of Brian Blessed's birthday cake at the top of Mount Everest, surrounded by the costume department of Downton Abbey. <laughs> if this isn't the perfect setup for improv-based shenanigans, then what is? 
Happy birthday, Mr. Blessing. <laughs> <laughs> so as I, that's, that's just reenacting what happened because I popped out the cake wearing nothing but the sash thing. Uh, Brian Blessed, you're my God, you know, along those lines. Yep. <laughs> and fortunately, the wind picked it up and threw it off me and I was completely naked. And then the costume department of Downton Abbey thought, quick, we must clothe him <laughs> for, the, for the good of all mankind. <laughs> <laughs> Way to put self yourself blood. down. Yeah, yeah. You're ugly, David. Well done. Um, so I put on the, the Lord Grantham's clothes, and then everyone immediately thinks, oh, he looks very prestigious. He must be able to tell us what to do, and we should follow him. So I say to Brian, I said, um, lend us your best um, Sherpas, Brian. And he goes, right ho and we, we borrow them. They're all dressed up as well, because why not? We've got loads of costumes. <laughs> and we all start trekking down the mountain, which is fun for all of us. Oh, I had the wrong trousers, so I'm leading the way, obviously. Well, Brian Blessed is so outraged by your nakedness that he shouts and causes an avalanche. <laughs> <laughs> which is quite handy, because it just means we get down even quicker. Except that you're buried under all the snow. <laughs> Damn it. Um, <laughs> luckily, the costume department also contains props. Um, one or two. One or two. One or two spades, I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Down to Nabi are famed for their spades, so yes. <laughs> there was that whole epi- there's a whole spade episode where there was like a riot and that sort of stuff. Anyway. Sadly, on radio, it was impossible to show the photograph taken of David on Mount Everest popping out of a birthday cake wearing nothing but a sash. Unfortunately, it's a limitation of the medium itself, I suppose. But, seeing as how we're no longer on the radio and this is YouTube... At this point, we must stop everything, as terrible news has reached us that Will has been caught by the police, travelling down the motorway on an unlicensed trebuchet with only a very old and retired Milky Bar kid for company. Oh, how will he ever get out of this? Yeah, it's just... I'm, I'm sorry, police officer, but <laughs> I, I don't have a good reason, but... Do you guys like Milky Bars? <laughs> so, pull out the Milky Bar kit, the Milky Bar man, I really should be calling you. <laughs> pull out the Milky Bar man, put, I, it's, we all One crowd around here, pointing it out the floor, just kind of demonstrating, look, it's the Milky Bar kid. They're fine with it, we go, because I've got a long way to travel in a minute. <laughs> we get to, the, we get to yeah. the coast, and I'm like, well, I can't leave the trebuchet behind. I'm going to turn it upside down. <laughs> you know the big swinging arm yep. and I get I get, I get rope because it's powered by rope and I have to pull the rope up letting it go yep. and it's like one massive swing of an oar I'm propelled forward about 50 feet into the ocean <laughs> into the ocean <laughs> it's upside down it's wood we're floating pull it again uh, yeah. let it go massive push forward it's making right. me very seasick but it's fine the Milky Bucket he's got a lot of like white chocolate it's very relaxing for your stomach <laughs> your cinema projector I'm guessing it's got like a reel in there it has it's yeah got, that yeah. gets wet and the film's ruined <laughs> Well, we're now no, no one can watch the Milky Bar Kid advert anymore. <laughs> no. And to be honest, this is probably the worst day of the outreach program he's ever gone on. <laughs> <laughs> we're now stuck in the middle of the channel, heading to Hong Kong. His wife's got no idea where he is. <laughs> and I've ruined the last intact version of his glory days. <laughs> <laughs> Ten seconds left. <laughs> 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 so I'm going to keep swinging myself along we get to Europe we're going to have to travel over things like the Alps to get to Hong Kong <laughs> yep. so we're pushing frantically we're pushing frantically <laughs> we're somewhere in Asia I've got no idea where Hong Kong is and so in the last ditch attempt I tie myself to the trebuchet tie the Milky Bar kid fling ourselves across and we pull the trebuchet behind us <laughs> wonderful <laughs> All right. Elliot is having no such problems however he has a small child in charge of a motor vehicle, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and a can't-fail plan to get himself to Hollywood, California. <laughs> so we, uh, we bomb it to Hull, and we get on the ferry to Belgium. And we, <laughs> we go through Europe, and we, we keep driving. The toddler, he's on the other side of the road. He's even worse now. <laughs> <laughs> And we end, we end up in Moscow. And Which I, way? You're going through Russia? Yeah. Okay, fine. I'm, I, I have to ask Uncle Vlad for a favour, and I bring out Rudolph's red nose. Uh, ah, red, no. get it? Yep. Red, no. Russia. Oh, right. Uh, <laughs> they've not been communists since like, yeah. the early and, uh, 90s. I, 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 show, I show it to him and say, this was, this was Lenin's, and he, he believes it. <laughs> and he takes it off, and I, I say to him, Uncle Vlad, I need a favour. One minute left. And it, I say, I, say I, need, I need to get to Hollywood. He's like, okay, no problem. He's fine. We put, we put you on the rock. We put you on rocket. Send you to the other side of Russia. You get, you know, you walk across Bering Strait. So we, we get on a rocket. We go to the top of Russia. Get to the Bering Strait, and I'm there hitching a ride off one of the guys from Deadliest Catch. He takes me. <laughs> the rest of the team tremble in fear, however, 
as Tom takes on all comers with his arsenal of mighty weapons and a very expendable companion in the form of Katie Hopkins. Now I'm ready for this. I brandish my garden hose like nunchucks. <laughs> managed to fight him off, throwing Katie Hopkins bravely into the way. <laughs> she can take the full brunt of his uh, attacks. Um, and then uh, proceed to catch a greyhound bus, because I'm in America, so greyhound bus, so relevant, um, to uh, LA, where I uh, buy like a massive load of raw meat. Uh, this will come back into it. I'm not just slowly losing my mind. Uh, and uh, prepare to set off surfing on my ironing board, having crafted Katie Hopkins a raw meat tuxedo, trailing her some feet behind, clinging onto the garden hose uh, so that we can do our sharks. You know, it's the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. I don't want to get eaten. Uh, the sharks are coming towards you, but although they smell the Katie Hopkins thing, they start tearing at the material of the ironing board. And as we all know, ironing boards are made of kind of grid sheet metal. Yeah. So you just start sinking. Oh, God, I'm in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, a passing rescue plane <laughs> uh, lands. A U.S. Navy guy comes. He's like, we've come from the USS Deus Ex Machina. And we're here to take you <laughs> most of the rest of the way to mainland China. Of course, since we last recorded that show, we've all heard of the tragic news regarding Katie Hopkins in that no tragic news has occurred regarding Katie Hopkins. A nation continues to hold their breath. Meanwhile, Jack finds himself travelling with David Beckham and must cross a large body of water. Will divine inspiration strike him with a plan? Then, uh, d then David Beckham says, Hey, wait a second, I'm also a good swimmer because I've done swim ads. Okay, <laughs> so, I, so I get on top of David, I'm like, you're right. Let's go and swim across. He's, One minute left. He paddles, he paddles his little took us away. Uh, unfortunately, he only knows doggy paddle, not breaststroke, so he's going slightly slower than you would have realised. Oh, fiddle, <laughs> fiddlesticks. <laughs> Luckily, I, I, I say, hey, if you learn how to swim really fast, I'll give you a nice scarf. And he says, oh, great. <laughs> then he, sw he swims faster. We get there. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Where's the Bugatti Veyron? You have to keep, yeah, you have to keep the Veyron. That's on top. You? Just on top of David. On top of David. <laughs> it's quite light. It's <laughs> I guess it is just a shell, yeah. <laughs> but because David Beckham is a footballer, all he has is lower body strength, not upper body strength to carry the Veyron. And he come and he walks on the water. <laughs> and sink to his death so, so, so you're saying that David Beckham is the new messiah basically well I don't want to say it but yes <laughs> essentially David Beckham is the new messiah he gets his Ten seconds left. using his magical Christian powers <laughs> I guess we'll allow a Jack Blanket <laughs> the later rounds in which fellow contestant Richard Dawkins argued that David Beckham was just a figment of Jack's imagination proved very heated Harriet, meanwhile, is far more interested in building a simple jigsaw with her Elvis impersonator companion. Uh, and I thought, oh my goodness! <laughs> oh my goodness, the pieces are massive! So what I'll do... <laughs> what I'll do is I will make the jigsaw puzzle over the ocean <laughs> because each piece yeah. is 18 miles. <laughs> How are you carrying like, this? It's because, did you never see Mary Poppins? <laughs> yeah, I've seen it, but I don't My believe it's real. My jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> wow, you're silly. You're swiftly stopped My... by North Korean officials who are very angry that you've constructed an inter, like, a, a, a picture of their glorious leader that can be seen from space, which dictates <laughs> him having a poo. They're really angry about this. They're trying to stop you. So I say to them, why so angry? <laughs> <laughs> We're having a laugh here, pals. And they North say, Koreans don't laugh. No, but they say, Harriet, do you know what? We've been swept up in all of this for so long. It's about time we did chill out and get on board. So, they, so I said, we'll get on board my giant jigsaw puzzle then. So we've all got on board, made some new friends. Al Including Elvis and Pussy. Yeah, well, because he's feeling a bit sort of left up. Well, in fact, he likes it as well, because didn't he die on the toilet? Yeah, he did. Yeah. So it's Your Elvis impertinent yes. uh, has a heart attack and dies on a jigsaw of, of the toilet. <laughs> How fitting. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and if you'd like a copy of that jigsaw for yourself, well, we can sort that out for you. Meanwhile, David finds himself in the lovely romantic starting point of Chernobyl with the lovely romantic David Attenborough 
and a lovely oversized ear trumpet. I'm enjoying myself very much on my romantic getaway for one. <laughs> Filmed by Sir David Attenborough for a recent documentary. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about there. And David is looking at Chernobyl. <laughs> the romantic views are fantastic. I don't think this is going to be on BBC One. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not always on BBC One, OK? <laughs> it's not like hit, hit, hit. He's got lots of misses that you never hear about. <laughs> and I'm one of them, OK? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but we realised that we have to actually go somewhere. The, the documentary will return to after a little bit racy. Mm -hmm. That's next on the playlist. <laughs> uh, but, um, so, okay. Sadly, in Chernobyl, all of the radiation is home to a very rare bug, the screaming maggot lizard bug. And yeah. David is obviously captivated by this. <laughs> well, as he should be, it's much more interesting than me enjoying the romantic <laughs> getaway for one. That's true. Um, uh, but unfortunately, I'm guessing they're sort of like... I don't know, not lethal, but they're just going to start nipping or something. They get very hungry. I... Uh, to be honest, if you're a maggot you lizard you bug that you screams a lot, there's, there's not really a huge, a huge amount to go with. Just... Okay, so I cover my ears and sort of start running away, kicking my pram along the floor with me. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, uh, while I've covered my ears, I also have an oversized ear trumpet in there, so it's actually very loud. <laughs> and now we briefly return to Tom, who just wants to clarify a few facts before he starts his next round. And just to clarify, Cupid's bow, shoot someone with it, they fall in love. The first person, first person they, they see. see. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. So, best of luck to you, Tom. Your time starts now. I go to Alison Bree's house and I shoot her. <laughs> <laughs> and then I retire a happy, happy man. And I give the round to Dave. No, I'm fine. I'm, Unfortunately I'm, I'm, for you, a mutated sea shark jumps in the way. <laughs> for true love, I will punch a shark in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> In case you were wondering, the wedding was indeed beautiful. And now over to Hugh, who has taken advantage of Alan Sugar's royal connections and is looking for passage across the Atlantic. Will the hover boots that repel one another come in handy? And what kind of devious plan is Harriet going to put in place to stop him? I, I ask, I ask Lord Alan Sugar to rein in one of his sexual favours and uh, and get me a ride on any mode of transport that the Queen has to hand. Unfortunately, the Royal Jet isn't isn't close by, but the Royal Sporting Yacht is uh, happens to be uh, very close by, and so is well, the one that gets me to the yacht. In fact, it ended horribly because uh, because Alan Sugar did the dirty on old Queenie. Uh, so the the yacht that you've been given was it a yacht? Yeah, it was a yacht. Yeah, that has bananas in hidden in the engine <laughs> <laughs> obviously okay <laughs> luckily yachts have sails so <laughs> turn my sails to the wind get myself swiftly out of the Thames and begin to make my way across the Atlantic towards America <laughs> uh, I'm, I've kept my pair of hover boots just for sentimentality's sake um, and quickly find this to be a, a hindrance due to the containment issues that come with having hover boots that don't want to be on the same boat together um, so I uh, decide to hold one uh, to the other and I fire them back towards England and fire one off and the momentum gives me that extra kick getting me across the ocean in super quick time but uh, hark yeah <laughs> you haven't really gone across the ocean because i sneakily had been laying out my jigsaw puzzle <laughs> and guess what matey you're back in honolulu <laughs> <laughs> right oh, so I'm in Honolulu. <laughs> I'm going to say the Royal Yacht came with me and uh, the Royal Clapping Machine is yet still applauding your efforts for getting me to Honolulu. I'm pretty sure and I leave it in Honolulu just clapping as a monument to this, this travel thing. Lastly, we move on to David Anik, who only has with him a horn that can summon a motivational speaker, a companion in the form of Tony Hawk, and his mode of transport is a fox who might betray him. What kind of adventures await as he attempts to escape from New Zealand? Okay, so I immediately... Oh god, do I get on this fox or not? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure <laughs> how to deal with this situation. Uh, I think I'll begin by picking up the fox myself and getting on the back of Tony, who unquestionably will have a skateboard, yep. as he is indeed phenomenal. And uh, start, uh, uh, sailing's the wrong word, whatever the sort of verb is for skateboarding. Oh, there it is. Um, <laughs> 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 <Come on. laughs> 
towards, towards, over the hills, past the orcs, towards the edge of the country. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I think it's a sort of north northwesterly direction. Pretty much, yeah, yeah, yeah. To head to the UK, uh, over, of course, water. Um, uh, so, I mean, uh, d- dare I go? I think foxes can swim. <laughs> I'll, I'll sort of grab on his fur with Tony, and Tony's got the skateboard on his back, and he looks so cool. And, you, uh, you, um, you find yourself being chased down by the, the Radio 4, uh, like, yacht, which can be sort of rented out. <laughs> Uncool Tony Hawk is, is coming to settle his beat. He's a Radio 4 presenter, in case anyone doesn't know. He's not, <laughs> he, he's not a radical dude. He doesn't even skateboard. I mean, come on. Uh, but he's come to settle Settle his beef finally over who gets to, to have Tony Hawk intellectual property rights to the name Tony Hawk, <laughs> yeah. which is now a thing. We definitely board the boat and unquestionably. I've just took- given you a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Great, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> 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 it's all good. We get on the boat, and unquestionably, my Tony Hawk can batter your Tony yeah, Hawk. Yeah, what was I like thinking? It. He's a Radio 4 presenter. <laughs> He's out of the way. We're just heavily boating it towards the UK. We're <laughs> conscious it'll take a while, but hell, I've got a fox that can probably talk. And we're chatting away, and he says some, you know, questionable things this morning. Oh. But nevertheless, we're still pals. And we, uh, we sort of we head on towards towards the UK, un un. Burden. Except for a hurricane, oh, which is the one thing I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping this is a sort of Dorothy in Kansas style hurricane. It's not, take a us fun, to our... it's not a fun magic hurricane. It's a, it's a displacing a hundred thousand people in Indonesia sort of hurricane. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I said displacing. It's fine. They, they were resettled. So we get caught up, left. We get caught up in the hurricane and become a part of said people who are with us. Because you know, if they're there, we may as well enjoy. You know, have make friends. <laughs> and uh, eventually the hurricane blows us up to the cliffs of Dover brilliantly where they <laughs> happily start a new life and, uh, and I'm all for it um, and, and uh, we, we uh, ride the back of the fox onwards towards I hate to do this to you but your fox betrays you <laughs> <laughs> if only I saw this coming and so as we come to the end of our journey together all that remains is for this strangely familiar fellow to wrap everything up. Fantastic there from everyone, but now we're going to find out the conclusion of this tale and who has won this a little bit racy. David Beckham's breath works perfectly and the inflated ball looks as beautiful as the game itself, especially placed on the kickoff spot of Wembley Stadium. The final score, 5-1 to Germany. Not that the referee was biased or anything. (laughs) (laughs) And (laughs) with all that said and done, tonight's winner is David Annick. (laughs) Well, that's all we got time for on this show. I'd like to thank panellists Hugh Clark, Harriet Dyer, Daryl Robson, Johnny Sire, David Ruddock, Elliot Green, Chris Cosentino, David Wiley, Will White, Pip Mason, Jack Prankett, Joe Darcy, David Annick, and Tom Harrison. I've been your host, James Cottle, and what? Well, this has been recorded? Oh, God! (laughs) (laughs) See you next time! Together, yeah. Mrs. Puggy Wuggy, Wuggy had a square cut punt. Not a punt cut square, but a square cut punt. It's round at the stern and blunt at the, at the front. front. Mrs. Puggy Wuggy, Wuggy had a square cut punt. You people are evil. <laughs> 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 Thank you.